expected our message to start talking about children is what I'm trying to get at and tell you. And I want you to bear up under it and to receive it because many of us feel like, well, this is basic. I love kids. You know, I love children. Uh, that's not true. Some of you said you're never having kids, and I, I just want to know why. Uh, but children, the Bible says children are a heritage, a blessing of the Lord. Amen. But it's so important, and as we taught this, this happened around our nation. There's been a couple of things that have happened. So I'm going to pick up for where we left off because I did walk through a little bit why God values children, and I did look at the typology of infanticide or what the Bible calls child sacrifice and how when cultures, and I'm going to get to this today a little bit, when cultures eroded in morality and the church or Israel became lukewarm or its prophets and priests became compromised through perversion, you saw civically a transformation in Israel's governance and governmental systems and they begin to openly legislate lawlessness and worship of Baal and worship of Milcom and worship of Molech and all of the, and the Asherah poles. And you see every time Israel is doing right, not only when the people are living and embracing the word, it seems that there's like an organic expression of godly civic leaders. Because God never creates separation of church and state. He created a complement of church and state. One to help bring structure and order externally and one to create structure and order spiritually. Because until you regenerate the human heart, you can't legislate sin out. You can't force it out. But you also shouldn't stand by as the church and believe that in the name of tolerance and love that you should allow the legalization of wickedness and evil. And we have seen in world history that the first assault from, pa from pagans to cults to dictatorships to moves in government is they recruit children, they indoctrinate children, they groom them to an agenda, and usually it's those kids that become the radicals. They become the ones that vote in di dictatorships because they, they don't have guidance from the older generation that has become lukewarm. And before it's said and done, the whole topography shifts. You see it all across Latin America. You see it all across Europe. And I'm trying to talk to you today that the reason you see the grooming and the, and the indoctrination of children, because if, chil if babies are just a lump of mass and cells, then that means even after they're born. We had a leader, a political leader, a Democrat leader. I, I don't care if you don't like us, a Democrat. It's the truth. Who legislated that a woman should be able to terminate the baby even after birth. Because eugenics is not just pre-birth, they're hiding behind false tolerance. They actually, if you philosophically and even spiritually believe that this is not nothing but soil and blood and the mass of cells scientifically, then guess what? You also do not, your value of children and life does not just automatically activate once they're born. Why do Christians believe that? And so we're watching the church become awakened and incest. And the world will say it's evangelicals. The world will say it's conservatives. Now, I'm here to tell you, turn off that ridiculous news channel. It is actually the, awake, the church awakening and starting to scrub out its spots and blemishes because they see the destruction and the erosion of the spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah. And not just them, but the spirit of, Com of Capernaum. When Jesus said the spirit of Chorazin, cities that he has been preached in and they rejected his gospel. And he said, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than it will be for you because you saw and you heard my gospel and you saw the miracles. Come on, church. This is not some Christian nationalist political movement. No, this is actually a church wakening up out of laziness and apathy, saying we can't hide in church buildings and really trust that unsaved people are going to have the best intentions for education and our kids and sexuality and home. No, no, no. God expects you to understand that Ephesians 2 said that they are the walking dead. That they're not born again. And until we fill the vacuum and begin to preach the gospel, that's the first part of spiritually. And then step in to say, no, 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 we cannot sit back. We must proclaim the standard of truth. In the spirit of Noah, in the spirit of John the Baptist, in the spirit of Jesus himself who walked through Israel and Galilee and proclaimed the truth and even exposed the lies of the Pharisees and the lies of the Sadducees. Why? Not to win the Pharisees and Sadducees, but to win an innocent generation that was following their leadership into perversion and destruction hallelujah Woo, boy, i'm on fire i put on some kerosene cologne this morning but i'm ready to hey jesus 
So here's a couple of things we saw why children matter. Yahweh said to Israel in Leviticus 18.25, I'm move quick. This is, this is, I can't stop here. I want to just catch some people up in the room scripturally. It said, practicing infanticide, which is equal to abortion or child sacrifice in the New Testament, can bring a curse and corrupt the whole land. Fact check me. Leviticus 18.25. Then he says again that I'll set myself against that man or even their whole house if they involve themselves in infanticide. Leviticus 20 and verse 5. Fact check me. God said if you sow into death culture, you'll see it in your household. Because it came to pass when Pharaoh, who was a civic leader, tried to abort Israel's babies and reaped it in his own children and his own household. That's Exodus 11, 4 through 6. The Bible is so clear on this because one of the things that Scripture says is that it is a blood curse through the shedding of innocent blood. Do you know that Proverbs 6 actually says that there are six things that the Lord hates? One of them, he said, is the shedding of innocent, innocent blood. So again, that means there, not all war is just, not all decisions, let's say even by law enforcement officers, I love them, we support them, but people make mistakes, and yes, people will be hold, uh, held to justice. But the truth of the matter is the most innocent and the most precious of innocence among us in a society is our children. So when you hear the Bible say the shedding of innocent blood, we think of every other adult we can see, and we completely forget babies, infants, and children. But that is the greatest expression, the most heinous expression of the shedding of blood. You see that also in Ezekiel 7, 23 through 24. God says, a blood, if you shed blood, an innocent blood on the land, I will put a curse on the entire land. Ezekiel 7, 23 through 24. He said explicitly in chapter 16, this is review. You guys got to listen to these messages in a week. He said in Ezekiel 16, 20 through 23, that that would happen if you also especially did it with children. How many of you know the greatest interest we have is preaching the gospel is one side of regenerating in this entire campaign of getting Christ in people, who is the hope, the hope of transformation and glory. But then there is a secondary side that if we don't proclaim and hold the salt and light standards to keep order in a society and a culture, that there will be so, so much anarchy and chaos, people will be killed and destroyed and cut off before they ever have a chance to hear the gospel. That is why it's our job to have a, some measure of Christian civic responsibility because God is the author of government. He is the author to keep things that, no, that doesn't save people. It doesn't deliver people. We're not to try to create a Christian army and take over the country through militaristic force. No, but we need to preach and we need to be salt and light and say, hey, you legislators, you people that God has raised in those areas, you have to repent and embrace the standard of God's word. But until the church awakens and reforms, that's why we're called the ark. Until the church awakens and reforms, we cannot see that kind of turnaround. We have to break the blood curse off of our nation. I believe that will affect even school shootings. I will believe that will even affect uh, a certain uh, racial resurgences where blood is starting to be shed because of, of, ungod of godless media and wicked people trying to get into the civil rights movement. They don't know what they're doing. They're full of the devil. They have no compass of, I know what the root problem is. The minute you're about to open your mouth and say sin, they say white people. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> you know what? This is a problem. Because if you will allow that with one group of people, then you become complicit to what was done to black and brown people. And you have entered into the same spirit of colonialism. And now where God could intervene, he can't intervene. Because many of us are on a high horse culturally. But the minute we get money and get prestige and position and power... Something remarkable happens. The minute we get loved and celebrated, now we say, it's payback time. Revenge is a dish best served coal. That's what the world's doing. And the church should not participate in that. And when you see a moral erosion in the culture, we have gotten so low that it went from just sexuality and gender and family to now we are openly indoctrinating children sexually. And, and it isn't just uh, LGBT. These are, there's also heterosexual molesters and abductors. Are you listening to me? 
And God is speaking through the church this hour. My church better rise up and pray and fight for the seed of the next generation because the pharaohs of this world's culture want to exterminate them on the birth stool. The pharaohs of this culture want to cut their lifeblood short and to cut them off. But God says they will not cut off the Moseses. They will not cut off the Joshua's. Even Jesus, when he was born, that same uh, legislative and, and civic spirit tried to exterminate the seed again. And Christians can't see this. But somebody shout, children matter. Say, babies matter. So I want to share with you this. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 11. Can I tell you every single time that I study the word, if you go through 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, if you look when Israel was repentant and spiritual, they never allowed their children to be sacrificed. They never embraced Abortion. Yes, the Bible is filled with biblical examples of abortion. Abortion was an invented term or the violation of children. We're not just talking about abortion. We're talking about valuing and fighting the violation of children because family matters and children matter. Why do we have to be men of prayer? Not just because we love Jesus, but our children are watching us. Why do we have to be women of chastity and, and purity and men of purity? Because our daughters and our sons are watching us. I don't know about you as a parent. When I want to get lazy and I have an attitude, my kids are watching me, I'll be like, oh, God. <sighs> Come on, let's pray. <laughs> you dumb on the phone. This dummy. Daddy, you're not about to. Oh. You're right. I'm not supposed to say dummy. Hey, come on, church. There's an accountability, and your children are watching you. They're hanging on your coattails. They're seeking. And do you not know that this generation is desperately in need of fathering? They're desperately in need of mothering. And there is no entity, there is no authorized agent in the entire globe that can father with the love of a father and a true mother outside of the blood bought church. We embrace and carry the heart of the father. One amen. I hope you all with me today. Pastor, why? Because look at the, the direction our nation is going. And in this church, we are, we are going to fight for life on every level. And we are not going to ignore children. We are not going to ignore the unborn. We just had a woman testify. We're partnering to help women who need places to work and rent and to, and to not abort their children in the Marietta Planned Parenthood. And we are partnering with them to help rescue those women, to help them get jobs, go back to school and college Come on, shelters, all these different things. Matter of fact, if you want to be part of a training, text LIVE to, this, to the number, to our ARC text line, L-I-V-E. Text LIVE, and you'll register, and we're going to have a training, a church-wide training, where you can learn how to be a sidewalk advocate, how can, you can minister and help people who are hurting. Amen. Not condemning and yelling and decrying people, but helping them to save the seed in their own womb. Say Amen. Now, I want to show you this. Turn to 2 Kings 21. The next point, number five, where we left off, is we see spiritual and civic leaders either caused, allowed, or incited many of these practices, like abusing children and even infanticide, which is abortion in America. And they legislated its acceptance in Israel and drove the people to lose their moral compass and sin against God. I'm going to prove it to you. 2 Kings 21 and verse 11. Turn there quickly. It says, and because Manasseh, king of Judah, had committed these abominations and had done wickedly above all that the Amorites did who were before him, he had made Judah, what did he do? Made Judah also to what? Sin with his idols. Judah is an analogy in the New Testament. It's not only one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but a power principle here is Judah also represents the tribe of leadership. When you look in the Bible, and when Jacob blesses his sons, he actually says the scepter of leadership shall not depart out of Judah. And so that tribe represents the men and the women who are the most notorious and the spiritual in the nation that God holds accountable. Now, study that out when you see Judah, because Judah is often mentioned a lot. And people said, man, where's all the other tribes? It's a metaphor that the notorious leaders that should have known better and had the scepter of leadership allowed it. Hence, Judah caused Israel to sin. And why? Manasseh was a leader, a king. We could say a, a, a senator, a congressman, a president. And he, he, watch this, has committed abominations himself, done wickedly, 
above all the Amorites who did before him. And the verse before literally says who God dispossessed. I mean, we just read that in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. He said he did worse than them. Then he led God's people, the greatest leaders of among them who should have known the word and known better. He calls them to sin with whose idols? His idols. You see why you need godly Christian civic responsibility? And it's not just preaching the gospel only, but you have to embrace the call of God for you to start nonprofits, to go into these sectors of entertainment and entrepreneurship and in the world. And don't get caught up in just making money out there. There is a mission, a kingdom mission, because there's a vacuum where the wrong leaders like Manasseh will bring their idols into those offices and force the people in our country to legislate abomination and bring greater sin. And then God said, I'm going to look to the Judah of the church. I'm going to look to the men and women who know my word. What are y'all doing? And yes, prayer is part of it. I know at times it can seem overwhelming. And God never promises that, that even a spotless church will, uh, like, erase sin and wickedness from every trace of the world. But we want to be able to be without spot and blemish in his eyes. It says we not only took intercession, but we took action. Why am I preaching this? Because some of you, your reason you're even called to this church and you felt a magnet in your spirit to be here, even though it's different than what you've seen and you heard, is because you know that God is about to do something in our nation we've never seen. And God is preparing the soil of your heart. He's preparing the ground. He's even shaking you up. He's even uh, spanked a couple of you. He's, come on, it, awakening means you have to be shook a little bit. So you can, have, you can have an eye-opening experience and return to a standard. God has done that with many of you because he actually has chosen you to be part of the end-time move of God, the end-time revival. And God is saying, I got to grow you from within because you are going to be a catalyst for change in this culture for my kingdom. Say amen. Jesus didn't die on the cross and raised from the dead to just get everybody on the earth go to heaven while all of the creation that he handmade, that he pinched the, the, the dirt and became the mountains, that he carved out the rivers and the streams. This is his planet. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He didn't just come to die for people. He came to reclaim his creation. Why does the church confuse this? No, all of this is just passing away. No, he recreated, he, he, he birthed the blood ball church, said be salt and light because I don't want you to just save the people. I want you to take it back. Come on, church. I want you to take it back for me. I want the birds chirping my glory and my praise. I want the animals teeming with life in the ocean because the sons of God have manifested. And because the manifestation, according to Romans 8, of the sons of God is causing all creation. It didn't just say the church. It didn't just say the culture. It said all creation. It's crying out for the manifestation of the sons of God. That means a son of God who isn't a child of God or immature child of God. See, if you're a son of God, you should care about creation, not just a culture or not just only the church. What are you bringing from God's church that is impacting the creation? When you think like that, you're a mature son. You're a mature daughter. Hallelujah. Turn to 1 Chronicles 33. Hurry up quickly. 1 Chronicles chapter 33. Glory to God. I want to show you something about another king, and I believe God is even going to start doing this in our country. First Chronicles chapter 33. Let's go to the middle and make a left. <laughs> First Chronicles 33, excuse me. 33. Let me make sure here I wrote that right. First Chronicles, let's see here. It might be second, but I, I don't know if... I, Sometimes I write the reference so quick I might have missed it. Well, I'm, I got all these books out. Let me see here, though. Now, hold on. Now, I see y'all out there whispering. <laughs> Pastor's in the Catholic Bible. He ain't in it. <laughs> you be quiet out there and you receive this. <laughs> Maybe it's, it's uh, uh, 2 Chronicles 33. There we go. Come on, somebody. Just wanted to see if you really turn to the passages. You out there sleep. Second Chronicles 33. Now watch, it said Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Now let's go to the beginning of this man. He reigned 55 years in Jerusalem, but he did evil in the Lord's sight like the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord drove out from before the Israelites. Watch this. So now Israel is backslidden and it gets backslidden leaders. Say this with me. You get the leaders you deserve. 
When you feel like that, man, what's going on with our leadership in the country? And, and yeah, maybe even in the church world. As goes the church, so goes the world. And he says, but he did evil in the Lord's sight, for he built again the idolatrous, watch this carefully, high places, which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. And he reared altars for the Baals and made the Asherim and worshiped all the hosts of the stars in the heaven, and he served them. And he built heathen altars in the Lord's house, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, shall my name be forever. He even built altars for all the hosts of the stars. That's called horoscopes. That's called the, uh, uh, all the different constellations people worship today. Astrology. And he burned, watch this, verse 6. And what did he do? He burned his children as an offering to his God in the valley of ben Hinnom, and practice sorcery. You'll always find a connection between Satanism, sorcery, and infanticide. Always. Oh, my God. I, I, didn't, I didn't get to send my media team, but I had a small clip of the Church of Satan trying to go through the legal route, literally from their direct website, where they talk about how uh, uh, they are pro-choice. And they are for children at a young age. And they say it clearly because they mock the church. They mock Christianity. And they say, we want children in their youngest ages to explore their sexuality. It's just scientific. And they say, we don't, we don't embrace Satan as being a real evil entity. He's just a figure of speech of those who rebel against tyrannical fascist leaders. And as the church of Satan, oh man, I wish I could have showed that clip. I forgot to send it to my list. It's a two-minute clip. And literally, he's, they walk through everything. A woman should not have to be able to hear a heartbeat. They actually take a segment for 60 seconds and talk about why abortion is a religious right that the church of Satan claims, and to come against abortion is to infringe on their freedom of religion. And they are, they are releasing lawsuits all over the country. And when you have wicked, ungodly leaders who have no moral compass, they, they, they will, when Christians come in and fight wickedness and lawlessness, they say, well, if you're going to fight this, we want to have, if you want a Bible club in the school, we want a, ch a church of Satan club in the school. And what they have done is cause those leaders to deny the church access who does more philanthropic humanitarian work than any agency on the planet. And then they, if they're wicked leaders who don't see past the deception, they won't allow any Christian activity. And that becomes a win for the church of Satan. Once the leaders do that, they drop their lawsuits. They don't even pursue it for money. They just drop their lawsuits. It's been happening all over the country. In Detroit, they actually uh, wanted to put up, like, a, a, a Christian symbol. And the Church of Satan came out and said, well, we want a Christian of Satan on a Baphomet. We want the horns. We want the pentagram. And if you put this up, we want this put up right exactly in that square. Do you know that those wicked leaders in Detroit actually listened to them, that they won, that they didn't win a case in the Supreme Court, but those leaders let them put one of those Satan imagery Baphomets and hit it because Christians or, I don't know who, uh, other people were starting to get around it and pray it, they even got the leaders to take it and hide it somewhere in the government. You think I'm giving you a fake news? I dare you to go look it up. I'm trying to tell you, church, can I say something to you? When Satanists are pro-choice and you're a Christian, someone's off sides. How many play football? Somebody's off sides here. Can we at least agree somebody's like, how is it we are supposed to be opposing antithetical forces that uh, uh, Scripture said in 1 Corinthians 6 that what fellowship has light and darkness, belial, belial, with God? And yet both of us are high-fiving. We're claiming we're Christians because we are representing love and tolerance. And even though I don't personally agree, I think this should be done all over the land. You will see that any time a wicked leader in the Bible was wicked and godless, he allowed idolatry and pagan practices to go all over the land. And you don't ever hear God saying, hold on, son, separation of church and state. Wow. Go on and keep listening to these godless leaders who indoctrinate you through media outlets. Boy, I feel like I'm in a soapbox today. But you just show me one time where God said, hold on, now you're going too far. There's no way you're going to force and legislate legally Israel to repentance. And you're doing a lot of civic stuff here now. You're getting in the community now and tearing down uh, totem poles and stuff. Now, hold on now. People need to choose me or not. You show me one time God does that in the Bible. God blesses those leaders. Even when the people want to murder them and kill them and some of them killed them. 
God blesses those leaders. And they were not prophets and preachers. They were kings, civic leaders. Now, look what the Bible says here. The Bible says that he burned his children. Anytime you see burning of children, anytime you see anything with the sacrifice or violation of children, that is equal to the agenda behind abortion. And it is the devaluing and the destruction of the seed. The church should lead the way in loving and valuing our children. Oh, no amens. We should lead the way on that. And I want to show you this. It says, and he set a carved image and he made it in the house and with a skim. In verse uh, 8, and I, he says, excuse me, and he, he said a carved image in verse 7 of an idol which he made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. And I will no more remove Israel from the land which I appointed to your fathers. When you go through this, you see in chapter after chapter, when a wicked leader rose up, he brought back abortion. He brought back sex cult temple prostitution. That's the move of sexual openness in America. You people, we have read through this and like, I can't stand history. I'm going to skip all this and just go to the New Testament. You have met so, you have lost many types and shadows of how God says, I don't save my people and give them my Torah, my covenant to hide in a church building. I give it to them so they can mentor and raise up civically responsible people who ultimately will not allow wicked abominations that come to destroy and eat the seed of the next generation. What's amazing is the next chapter, judgment hits Manasseh and all this thing, and then God raises up a young boy by the name of Josiah. See why Satan wants to destroy the seed? One of the youngest kings in all of Israel's history was a little child. My son Jaden was the same age as King Josiah when he started reigning. And do you know he's one of the greatest reformers? He's literally called one of the greatest reformer kings by theologians in the Bible. And you know what he did? I think I should show you. Look in, look in, look in uh, uh, go back to chapter 20, uh, 23. Let me see here. I mean, 2 Kings, go to 2 Kings 23. I didn't have this plan, but I'm going to go through this. 2 Kings 23, quickly. Are you guys learning today? It's so important. Because some of you, you're about to get married, or some of you are pressing into marriage. You need to have a strategy for your kids. Sometimes, it's not, I'm not saying it's wrong to go to public school, but you should believe God. Don't just because of money, you don't believe God can give you scholarships and God can give you state grants. And, and some of you have been out here saying, well, what are we going to do? You need to train your kids. You can't wait for people to educate your children. Do you know when the Greeks invaded Israel, that they were indoctrinating the Jewish kids to abandon Torah, which is the same as teaching our kids today to leave the Bible. And they created their own schools called the yeshiva schools, Y-E-S-H-I-V-A, the yeshiva schools. And they had their kids up in there at like two and three and four years old. By seven and eight years old, they, they were able to quote the whole Torah because the, 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 Helen, Helen, the Helen age, uh, Hellenization schools would begin around eight or nine years of age. The Jewish people had a strategy to circumvent that and get the word inside of their kids. That is our responsibility. And this is why you, you'll hear a lot of leaders who are not cowardly talking about Christian civic responsibility because it's not political idolatry. But why is it do we have to wait until a real dictatorship and a horrible change happens where now we all have to hide just to pray? Hide just to read our Bibles. That nobody wants to, they're not going to hide it no more. They're going to say, get your Christian butt out of here before I blow you away. Don't come in here in no town hall meeting and say, what you, I'll arrest you right now. Why do we have to wait to that? And then you know what Christians do at that point? Then they want to pray. Then they want to be like, oh, Lord, we run the heavens and call upon thee. Years and years, the prophets and leaders of the body said, stop being lazy and being afraid of getting in government. Stop letting lukewarm Christians tell you that that's political idolatry. You better bring my word into the space because if you love not only your kids, but even sinners' children that you don't need the gospel, then you better get out there and you better fight to protect them. Mm-hmm. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer didn't go for that. He, saw, he, he was a theologian who was a powerful German theologian, and he had a very prestigious job as a professor in doing ministry in the United States. And the Lord revealed to him that there was a dictator rising in his home country, that he had to abandon everything he was doing. He lost money, property, everything. He said, go back for Germany. This is what he said in his, his memoir. Germany has lost its way in the church. He said, go back. And he said, and he began to preach. And let me tell you something, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was no sissy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would, would literally go and, and preach to Nazis. They could kill him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would literally do discipleship. Uh, it, the craziest things you can think of. Dietrich Bonhoeffer literally said, if the church does not preach the gospel and get involved in culture and be salt and light, he said, the gospel's effect and reach can be destroyed. And he knew firsthand because he preached in Nazi Germany. And ultimately, he was killed before a firing squad by the Nazis for his stand. Do you know now they have in the secular government, see what I'm saying about Christians? Everyone hates you and they're mad at you until they see the hand of God on you. Until they see things being changed like Josiah at eight years old coming through and like young David's and young Hezekiah's. Everyone wants to oppose you and say that you've lost your way. You don't know the word. You're going too far. And then when the hand of God comes and their children receive freedoms and blessings and the spirit of God begins to flow and move, then those people go from, uh, uh, then they want to make monuments and memorials out of you. Do you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a monument in, I think it's Munich, in the center of the capital of Germany. And this is a Christian preacher that secular leader said, you try, it says on his monument, you tried to warn us. You tried to save the soul of Germany. And they honor a Christian preacher. You want to tell me he had a bad witness because he was bold and speaking out against government and against the evils of the murdering of the Jews? That's no different than speaking out against abortion or any other evil, heinous practice. He didn't get no flowers when he was alive. And he went down murdered before a firing squad. But now a secular nation has a Christian preacher as a monument in his capital saying, you tried to save the soul of Germany. Don't be so quick to say someone's marring their witness until you see the end effect of what they do. Church, this is our time and our hour. Now, I'm going to have to close with this here. But look, in 2 uh, Kings 23... Now, Josiah is my favorite. If you have a heart for reformation and to be a reformer, I'll tell you right now, you better study the life of King Josiah. What a powerful king. I mean, a powerful king. Oh, glory to God. Let's, let's start in verse 22, because it was about to go there in um, Chronicles, but we'll pick it up in this version of the story. It says, and Josiah was eight years old when he began his 31-year reign. 31 years. His mother was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David, his forefather, and turned not aside to the left or to the right. In the 18th year of King Josiah, he sent Shaphna, son of Azalea, the son of Mahabababa, you know, all that stuff, the scribe, to the Lord's house, saying, Go to Hilkah, the high priest, that he may count the money brought into the house of the Lord for the keepers of the house, because they, they were letting the church, it was so bad, stealing so much money, that even the priests and the prophets and wicked civic leaders uh, took so much money that the house of the Lord was just breaking down, decrepit. And he said, I need to get an inventory. He said, because I want to repair, verse 5, the Lord's house. And he started setting up the carpenters in verse 6 and 7. And he said there was no accounting required for the money delivered into their hands because they dealt faithfully, meaning the priesthood. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shephna, the scribe, I have found the book of the law of the, of the law in the house of the Lord. And Shaphna, the scribe, came and the king reported to him. And listen to what this says here. Verse 11, and when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothing. They were so backslidden that they had left the Torah out. The, watch this. Society was so backslidden and destroyed because the temple had allowed the Torah to be set aside. It was so immoral that they couldn't even find the Torah scroll. The Bible. 
that they're supposed to teach the people out of. Then he found it, and when he heard it read, something happened. I'm here to tell you, reformers have to go back to having a heart for God's law and order, for God's word and God's truth, especially for saving the next generation. I'm telling you, there's something heavy on my heart because Satan is coming so strong for our children, and God is really impressing upon me. The anointing of Josiah has got to come on the body of Christ, come on the church. Are y'all with me today? has to come on the church, not only to preach the gospel, but to get up and change some things. It said that he went through an awakening because in verse 12, he began to go crazy. We don't have time to read it all, but he began to go through all of this. And he began, look at verse 10 for time's sake, because I, I, I have to show you just in verse 10. In, in, uh, in 2 Kings, we'll go to 2 Kings 23 and verse 10, but uh, uh, I want to show you this real quick. He says in verse 19, he goes through all of these changes in Israel, and he's ta- he starts tearing down the places where they abort and kill children. You see this all through Josiah's life. Anytime you see Baal, anytime you see Molech, those are places that they would kill their kids. Those are like your abortion clinics. In verse 19, look what God says to him. Because, look on the screen. I know I'm moving a little fast, but we're about to close here in a little bit. Because your heart was tender and penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord. When you heard what I said, when, when, he, when he heard God said, I'm going to judge Israel and my people for allowing these wicked practices to come in to my house and to cause them to backslide. He said, when you heard what I said against this place and against its inhabitants, that you should become a desolation and an astonishment. And what does that say? A curse. And you rent your clothes and wept before me. I have also heard you, says the Lord. And I will gather you to your fathers, taking you to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see the evil which have been brought upon this place. I don't know about you. If you don't know, many of our generals have been dying the last 10 years in the church. I can tell you about 15, 20 major generals that have passed from the scene. And it makes me wonder to say if God spared them to see the evil that could come on our nation if the church does not awaken. But I want you to see in verse 23, I want you to take this home as your homework and walk through this and show you all of the different things that he did. Now, jump to verse 10 in 2 Kings 23 and 10 for time's sake. He goes through here and he makes a covenant with the Lord. He reestablishes every law being based back on the word of God. He removes the fake and the false priests. He takes out a wicked, ungodly leaders. He literally destroys the altars. Come on, church. This is what a righteous leader, and righteous people support to remove this. What does he do again in verse 10? And Josiah defiled Tophet, that's another name, in the, in the valley of Ben-Hanom, that no man might ever burn his son or his daughter as an offering to Moloch. You'll see in every righteous king, they went after the violation of children and infanticide. And they eradicated it. Every ungodly king reinstituted it. You know, people said, Pastor, you know, it feels like we're, we're like snail mail in America. You know why? Because we live like the book of kings. One moment we'll get a, a, a half-decent president who says we can't allow all of the moral foundation to be destroyed. Uh, and then uh, whatever he puts in place... The next president comes in and takes it all away. (laughs) You know, and this is why people can be hopeless and they become apolitical and apathetic, but we cannot afford to do that ever. We must stand for truth and we must cast our vote for Christ and for his culture and what he's doing and let God see us and pray and take action because one thing about the Lord, he's the God of the underdog. And the, and the Bible says that you are the apple of his eye and he would never leave you nor forsake you. And I believe any advances we see that help protect even the lost family and their children and even certain economies is because the church is praying and the church is interceding and God doesn't, he does it first for the church and that affects all of a a civilization or a a population. Are you with me? So I'm going to say that right here. If any pastor who says they support abortion, any pastor or leader who who acts like that's nothing to be looked upon when they when they push their congregations to support candidates and people, and they think that's a small thing, they have entered into the spirit of Manasseh. 
They have entered into the, in the line of the wicked kings that God left us an entire litany of an example of what not to do. And as a Christian, you don't support anybody who does anything like that. You understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah, I don't care who don't like it. Churches need to get back to having some backbone, telling the truth. All right. Last one here. God ascribes the utmost value and design and worth in the womb. Turn to uh, Psalms 127, uh, Psalms 139 very quickly. We'll close with this point here. Psalm 139. Next week, I'm going to preach on fathers and ministering to fathers. Amen. And I have a powerful word from the Lord. But turn to Psalm 139. Praise God. I want to challenge you. Go to First and Second Kings. Go to First and Second Chronicles and see the typology that is set there, guys. We as the church must repent for allowing this wickedness to come into our culture on our watch. I said we have to repent. And as a pastor, I'm not telling you something I don't live. I've been preaching this for years. I go out and I minister to people. We've helped save hundreds and hundreds of people and their children, help children get homes and, and just a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm telling you, if each one of you do your part and you get a new fire in your heart to say, I don't care who don't like it on my job, I don't care, relatives, whoever, if you don't see this is about protecting the family and protecting children, and the reason I stand for marriage is not to say I hate someone. I'm holding to marriage that supports a husband and a wife because we need godly seed that is born and reared up in such a way that we can start, we, we, we can start uh, raising the next generation to be the torchbearers. Let me tell you, did you know that God describes value in the, in the womb even before birth? I want to show it to you in Psalms 139. Amen. Put it on the screen. Psalms 139, starting in verse 13. Praise God. Hallelujah. Are y'all with me today? Amen. Psalm 139. I'm going to turn to my Bible here in the AMPC. Praise God. Look, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my rising and you know my sitting. And in verse 13, it says, For you did form my inward parts. And you did what? Knit me together in my what? My mother's womb. Therefore, I will confess and praise you, for you are fearfully, for uh, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Or the fearful and wonderful awe of my birth, for wonderful are your works. Whose works? Is it the mother's works? If the mother did not create or design, or knows even the technology that puts bone to bone and sinew to sinew, cannot create one brain cell, can't even create a nanomillimeter of a vein, doesn't know anything that occurs, she is not the one creating it. Just because you put a loaf of bread in the oven, don't make, don't make the oven, uh, doesn't mean that the oven is the one that created the bread. The Bible says here that God's wonder of his birth, and it is his work and my inward self knows it well. For my frame, where? In the womb, was not hidden from you when I was formed. In the secret, intricately and curiously was I wrought, as if embroidered in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my what? Excuse me, look at verse 16. Your eyes saw my what? So does it matter what month? Your eyes saw my what? So you could take that to the sperm cell touching the egg. It don't matter. And in your book, how many days? From the days of birth? No. What did he say? My unformed substance, God already had a book with my name on it. And all the days of my life were written out. It's a shame Christians who are crying out, pastors, just tell us the truth so we know what to believe and leaders won't do it. And look, he says, written before they ever what? When as yet there was what? Not a one of them. Question is, no, no, for time's sake. Then we see in Jeremiah 1.5, turn it real quick, super fast. I'm, I'm almost done. Jeremiah 1.5, it's just a couple pages over. You got to see this because I got somewhere I got to get to next week. Jeremiah 1.5, praise the Lord. You got to see this. Psalm 139, then Jeremiah 1 5. What does God say to the, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament? 
What does it say? Before. It doesn't say when. Before. Verse 5. Starting in verse 5. Before I what? Where? I what? Not only knew you, but what? As my chosen instrument. So before, listen to me, you got to think about this. When the sperm touches the egg, you're in the womb. Do you realize that? Before I formed you. Something's forming the minute that sperm touches the egg. Before I formed you. That means this happened in his mind in the heavens. I approved you. I approved of you as my what? That means God approves you and then chooses you for something to be his instrument before the sperm touches the egg. And what? Not only does he approve and not only does he choose, but he what? He separates and sets you apart, consecrating you, and then he appoints you. Listen, listen to how many things happens in one verse that God does before the sperm touches the egg. Before the sperm touches the egg, God says, I knew you. I approved you. I, call, I chose you. I separated you. I set you apart. I consecrated you. And I appointed you a prophet. How was that? Seven things? So, so let me ask you a couple questions in closing that you could, you could walk away and meditate on this. Did these verses even debate weeks to determine personhood? Okay. This is political, Pastor. Well, go on and delete these verses out of the Bible. I don't know. The Bible is so political. It's amazing. Uh, a a seven to 10,000 year old book, and America's only 240 years old. And I guess our recent appearing just supersedes the Bible, huh? I guess this is just Republican stuff. Is this Republican stuff or conservative stuff? Is that what y'all see when you see things like this? When this Bible is thousands of years its predecessor? Hmm? It's the word of life. Who formed it? The mother or God? Whose choice was it? The mother or God? Does God seem to refer to it impersonally as a fetus or as a person already? And even though there's heartbeat bills that say, that say no abortion till the heart starts, I mean, I guess that's good. But does God say that he waits till your heart beats before he did those seven steps? But here, this Christians will argue with preachers and leave churches over this because you have an idol in your heart. Let me get up and hit on race. Folks will be like, I'm staying in this church, which I do all the time. I hate racism. But the minute we come down the aisle and we start messing with people's personal idols, people say, I don't know, this is political. No, embrace the conviction. And if you are a Christ follower, then you embrace from Genesis to Revelation. And it's an entitled American spirit to think that we're going to get saved and God's going to do all the changing and conforming to us. Last time I checked, you are to change and conform to the Bible. And whatever it believes, if God is pro-children, pro-life, pro-family, I know you don't like the word pro because that's so politicized, but I'm doing it on purpose. If he is pro-marriage, if he is pro-biblical uh, uh, sexuality, if he is pro-biblical gender, if he is pro, I don't care what it is, then that's what you are. And you don't let nobody intimidate you and make it political when you could take them to the Bible. Now, you take me to verses as a Christian and show me what I'm saying is twisting and deceiving the word. God speaks of a preexistence before birth. Does it exist before birth? Of course. Now, here's what's deep. If a baby can be a prophet to nations before a sperm and egg even meet in the womb, can they be a doctor? Can they be a lawyer? Can they be a teacher? Come on, church. The very people that reared you, trained you, taught you, made you who you are today, entrepreneurs. Come on. In the text, does killing the child kill these assignments then? Because God seems to have had a whole book in another verse written out with all the days, the plans. He has a sevenfold step in here before sperm touches egg. So the question is, as a believer, should you ever politicize interrupting God's creative process for a book that he's written and the life of a human being? Whether you plan the birth or not, God does not create haphazardly. You know what's amazing? We may have not planned for a... <laughs> Come on, church. Oh, Lord. You know, many of us were born out of, out of wedlock. And look how amazing you are today. Huh? Don't you realize that whole Bible is about things that are unexpected and, 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 and bad situations and circumstances and turning them for the good? That God even says, I take the foolish things or what the world says is foolish and I make them the most wise. 
Didn't you know an unplanned pregnancy is how Jesus even came? So much stuff, people don't listen. Pastor, why are we preaching this? Because children matter. Babies matter. Don't say you're a family man, a woman of family, a woman of legacy and generational building, and you don't want to talk about this. So in the text, if God has an assignment, if you kill an assignee sent from God, did you just murder a person with a purpose from their creator? Yes or no? The scripture is already implying it. If you murder a person God designed with life and assignment, are there consequences for interfering with the Almighty? These are questions you think about right from the text. Do you believe God's word is true, and will you cause the word to change, or will you change to conform to the word? See, all of that in these texts of scripture They'll even have Christians and, and, and people who lie and twist scriptures and say, you know, but what about these verses? God has never, there were times where there were so, there was a, an instance or two where there, the people were so decrepit with bestiality and uncleanness and they were so corrupted that God did wipe out whole people groups. But that was one or twice in a small instance. That was not something he ever taught Israel to do and made a standard that carried over in the New Testament. That was an unfortunate reality. Even Sodom and Gomorrah, God tried to save that whole city with all of his corruption. He couldn't get 10 folks, 10 Jews in there, let's say 10 Christians worth with a spine enough to form Do you know 10 people create a synagogue in Jewish culture. What God was saying, can I just get 10 men in Sodom and Gomorrah and I can form what is called a minyan. And the minyan is the nucleus of a synagogue. And the synagogue is the nucleus of a future temple. And that can change the whole city if I could just get 10 men. I, he, God did, listen, there was a whole bunch of perversion. And God said, but I still want to save the city. Do you know when God ever had to wipe out civilizations and destroy them, it's because for millennia they killed his prophets. They did not repent. And guess what? The greatest victims was how they murdered and killed their children. God said, wiping it out. Church, as I close right here, I want you to meditate these. And I pause this because I truly believe we have to pray. There's more things that are going to try to come. Since that last shooting, you know how many other shootings have been stopped? There's been a f one or two that's happened, but there's been many, thanks be unto God for the churches praying that have been thwarted. There have been whole teenagers. There was one teenager that literally, he had a whole network in the school where he had already recruited multiple teenagers. So not a lone shooter, but a whole group of them. Church, if we do not get back in the cultural fight, not just sitting in here and enjoying Jesus, but preaching the gospel, you got to get out there and start winning the lost. Church, listen to me. Thank God for what God's doing in here. But there's, I believe God is already shaking you and pushing you a little bit. I believe where God is moving us or where he's taking us, you have to awaken. It can't just be my, my kids only. What about other kids dying and going to hell? What about kids that are being victimized? What about women who would make terrible or men make poor choices? But here you come being led of the Spirit of God, and you speak the Word of God, and you preach Jesus to somebody, and a life is saved. And that could be the next president, the next prophet, the next leader of our nation. You don't know the implication and the fruit of your obedience. Come on, stand to your feet alone with this church in Jesus' name. Thank you for allowing me to finish this thought here. It is so important because I'm going to get more involved. And you better get ready to see your pastor. I've already been doing that, if you know me. I've been doing this for 20 years. But I'm going to get more involved because once Roe v. Wade is overturned, I'm going to be one of those pastors on the front line to ensure, and I don't care about no red or blue, to ensure that children are saved. And you'll see my beautiful brown face up wherever it needs to be speaking the truth. Now, if people leave my church because of that, let them leave. And people say, you know what? We got a pastor who loves, if he loves children and fight for kids, then I know he'll fight for my kids and fight for my family. And the truth is, I love you. You are my first responsibility. I love you, your wife, your kids, me and my wife. And we pray for you every day. But I cannot preach and be a man of God worth my salt. And I only limit my voice to this room. I have to speak the truth of God and do what I got to do. 
and I'm going to do it because one of my legacies will be that I was a Dietrich Bonhoeffer of Georgia that I fought to the very end to save and not just saving children in the womb against all evil egregious wickedness and I'm going to proclaim the gospel and I believe God will heal he will deliver I'm wait. I'm believing God for demons to be spelled on live television right here in Georgia the power of God flowing an awakening hitting the pastors of every color and every ethnicity all over our city to truly embrace righteousness again and preach the whole counsel of God. How many of you are with me? Church, I said, how many of you are with me? You know, I've been hated for a long time just for saying the word of God. Not my opinion, but saying the word. But I don't care. I'm in good company in the cloud of witnesses. Lift your hands all over this room and begin right now to reconsecrate your heart and ask the Lord. Because many of you have heart to reach people, but where is your heart to reach children? Where is your heart to reach youth in the next generation? I'm believing God that Ark City Church starts having an explosion with youth ministry. It has an explosion reaching middle schoolers and high schoolers and children. Some of you have doors to these, to these areas. We're going to start connecting them to our church and loving our children, helping our children in another dimension. I believe God will bless your finances. I believe God will bless your home. I believe many of you who couldn't have children, God will bless you with a house of your own because you, like the midwives in Egypt, say, I will not allow the seed to be exterminated on the birth stool of the next generation. Lift your hands in Jesus' name. Father, we just pray and we consecrate right now. I pray over every man, woman, boy, and child in this room. Lord, I have preached what you've told me to preach. And Lord, as we move into parenting and move into some of the, the, the patriarchs and some of those other areas of sonship and going into team teaching with my wife, I thank you in this moment. Let this be a, 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 a hallmark message, these last two messages or three messages. And let them affect this church as they've never seen. And may the devil never slither into Ark City Church and try to offend people through false definitions of politics, knowing that this is biblical. Maybe not every, every subject in the world, but fighting for children and fighting for life, fighting for marriage, that needs to be taught. It needs to be said. And so, God, I pray for your people. I rebuke the spirit of cowardice if, there, if many are dealing with that. Because it's not easy for people to, be, to hate you or to be angry with you when the truth is you're just trying to not only save their spirit but save their children and save their homes and save their families god what i ask you lord for a revival in the lgbt community we do not hate them they're our brother our sisters lord i ask you to bring them in and, and save them and fill them. come on church and fill them with your holy spirit and may we have a mature congregation enough that can handle it and begin to guide the women guiding the older women guiding the younger and older men guiding the younger men and that they were mentored and discipled and lord we bind up the spirit of transgenderism that is trying to come and groom our kids because satan knows that you are sending prophets like Jeremiah. You are sending teachers and leaders all over the land in every color and every ethnicity and they are coming and they will not back up from the devil and they will not be afraid and the devil knows that you're sending end time deliverers and he's trying to use the pharaohs of fallen culture to exterminate them in the womb. But Father, in the name of Christ, I thank you for an awakened church. Remove the spot, the spot and the blemish out of us where we have ignored this atrocity while we have fought other atrocities. Forgive us, Lord God. Forgive us for backing up when the Philistines of fallen culture with their giants of Gath and their Goliaths stood in front of us and said, I wish you would say something. I'll cancel you. I'll fight you. I'll remove you. I'll take you out. Lord, let the spirit of David come on this congregation and let stone be put to sling in every hand in the spirit. I wish y'all would hear what I'm praying. And Lord, let them whirl it around and let like black hop helicopters, let the sound swirl over the head in the spirit realm and say to every principality and every power, you cannot shut our mouth. You cannot muzzle us and you cannot stop us. You will see a church in our city church of black and white flesh and yellow flesh and brown flesh loving each other, marrying each other, protecting each other's children, going out and preaching your gospel, going in the highways and the byways, laying hands on those broken and destitute. Lord, I speak the vision fresh. I speak it fresh. Father, in the name of Jesus, we will not ever lead a dead church of people who will not do anything, but will preach your gospel, who will continue to grow continue to crucify their flesh and take up their cross for you are coming very soon 
Oh, in the mighty name of Jesus. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Whatever head bowed, every eye closed. If you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we're not going to take, we're, we're not going to beat around the bush with it. We're going to be straightforward. You need to lift your hand and wave your hand right now because God wants to save you. If you're already Christian and you want to step out of, of just, of, 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 of a mundane existence and you want to be reset in refreshing and fire and take a stand for truth, righteousness, and justice to be a witness for Jesus. I want you to lift your hand right now. I want to pray for you right now under the sound of my voice. I'm looking all over this room. Do not hesitate. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to lift your hand as I look across this room right now. Boy, I feel like I see in the spirit realm some of the greatest leaders our city has ever seen yet is about to be born and come out of this building and affect our city, I'm telling you. Oh, hallelujah, you just may be one of them. Lift your hand as high as you can to say, Pastor, I'm ready to accept Christ. Or, I've accepted Jesus and I'm ready to rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. Put your hand up right now all over this room right now. I see that hand, man of God. I'm proud of you. We need you, man of God. We need you as a father in this generation. We need you. Oh, thank you, God. Anyone else under the sound of my voice? Wave your hand so I know you're not just worshiping. I see that hand, woman of God. Is that you? Praise God. Come on, church. God, there are people making decisions for Jesus in this room right now. So, Father, I want you to pray this prayer, short prayer with me. Those of you who had your hand up, say, in, in the church, I want you to pray together with me. Say, Father, come on louder. Father, in the name of Jesus, I accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. Get those connect cards ready. I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. If you've already been born again, say this with me. God, I repent. I refresh. I recommit. And I rededicate my life to you. From this day forward, I am not going to be one foot in, one foot out. I'm making a public decision. I am making Jesus the head of my life again. Now say, Holy Spirit, refresh me. Come into my heart. Fill me. Give me my prayer language. Give me power in my voice and my hands to fight the kingdom of darkness in my generation. Now say this. Say, Satan, I serve you notice. You are not the God of my life. Get your hands off my marriage. My children... My home is under the blood. All my sins have been washed away. Shame, go. Blackmail, go. I'm free. Free to run. Free to worship. Free to learn God's word. Free to be a disciple of Jesus. Right now, in Jesus' name. Can you put your hands together and give the biggest shout of praise for these who have made decisions for Jesus? Come on, church. God is 